Or not. Or not. God, we just come before you. We want to acknowledge who you are and what you say we are. Can you help us just to see the longing that you have for us in our hearts and how much you endured to to give us this life that we can live in, God. May we just set aside things that are distracting our hearts right now, God, and distracting us from seeking you. And that we could see you and what you've done and what you've called us to be, God.
I want to read a verse here in a little bit, but I've just been thinking about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, you know, the throne of God that we were just singing about, and a little bit about last week what John Rich had shared with us about Jesus not even knowing the time when, when God's time is to come snatch us up. And uh, it just made me think of how much more wild and fierce and intense that love must be for him for us than he, him not even knowing the time and how he wants to keep that flame alive until that last disciple you know, preaches the good news and he says it's time. And um, how Jesus, when he was even on this earth, Long to snatch us up even then. He cried out, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you up. And it just make me think of, you know, if he had lost hope and he had lost that flame, you know, that love for us and, and what that would have looked like if he had, you know, maintained any regrets about the pain and suffering he was going to have to endure for us and... Thankfully, he didn't maintain any regrets for what he did. And in Hebrews 12, 1, 1 and 2, Therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let's, let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract to, sorry, <laughs> I lost my place, to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith and is also its finisher. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And if we could just embrace this love, this strong love he has for us, and he sort of just smacked it on us like a kiss, like we're going to sing in this next song. And um, just pray that we, the regrets that we have in this life, God, the, the things that make us stumble, the things that distract and entangle us, that we can, you can help us rise above those, God, and fan this flame that you have for us.
Good, <clears throat> good morning. Morning. Um, I, we have two celebrations this morning um, that we want to celebrate. And I think we have some special guests here. Um, and I want to see if they're inside here. Is the Christiansons here inside the sanctuary this morning? I don't see. There you are. Please stand. Please. Yes, yeah, it's embarrassing, but you got to stand at least. There we go. Christiansons are back. Nice. We love you guys. It's so good to see you guys. It's just awesome to see you guys. So that's number one. Welcome back. Please give them a lot of hugs um, afterwards. And secondly, I just want a quick announce. We have a celebration of a baptism after the service of um, Joyce Tsihang Zhao. I tried to pronounce that right. It's our Chinese sister. Um, so we're going to have a baptism after the service right in front here. So I just want to welcome you. If you want to join for that um, celebration, you're more than welcome. If not, may I ask you to just be a little bit considerate and move the fellowship kind of to the back so that we can just hear what's going on in the front here. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris, for that warm introduction. <laughs> and really, you shouldn't have said those things about me. They're not true. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Mac family. My name is uh, Bob Petty. This is my wife, Mary Kay. And uh, we uh, serve the Midwest District of the CNMA and have been uh, in your midst uh, over the last uh, several months and are delighted to be with you uh, this morning. I've asked uh, before we open God's Word this morning that uh, you participate with us in a uh, bit of a spiritual exercise. And so I've asked Mary Kay to come and to facilitate some preparation of our hearts uh, before we encounter God's Word. And so, Mary Kay, why don't you walk us through that? And you can use this mic. Of course, you can do whatever you want. Good morning. Let me read for you some verses from Matthew 11 to start us off. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble in heart, and you will find rest, relief, and ease, and blessed quiet for your souls. For my yoke is wholesome, it's useful, it's good, it's not harsh, it's not hard, sharp, or pressing, but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be borne. So this morning, most of us walked through those doors carrying something in with us. We all carry around burdens and concerns. And we think as believers that we have given those to the Lord and the Lord's going to take care of them. But if we're honest with ourselves, if you're like me, it's still kind of stewing back there, and I'm still carrying it. So there's a little exercise that we do called closed hands, open hands. It's just a physical act of what's going on inside of our hearts where we bring that concern before the Lord, and we speak it to him, and we give it to him. But as we give it to him and he takes that concern, we then ask him, what's your perspective on what I just gave you? Because until I hear the Lord's perspective, it's really easy for me to pick that burden right back up when I walk out the door. But when you hear the Lord speak and tell you what he wants you to know about that burden, that he's got it covered, or whatever it is that he speaks to you, you can let it go. So this is just a discipline in taking time to stop and to actually ask God to speak and listening for his voice. So let me read these verses to you again from the message, and then we'll walk through this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. 
Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So why don't we close our eyes for a moment. Let's just take those first three words, come unto me. And listen to the Lord say that to you this morning, come unto me. And it's an invitation. You can choose to come or you can stay where you are, but he does invite us. And so as we sit in his presence, if you would just picture what that burden is that's on your heart. It might be financial. It might be a relationship. It might be your future. It might be your health. And take that thing, and what I do is I close my hands physically to just picture to myself that I've been holding on to this thing. So if you would take that thing and you would close your hands around it, that's the closed hands part. And would you picture yourself kneeling down before the Lord Jesus? And as you kneel before him, look up into his eyes. And you'll see that his eyes have no condemnation. That they're eyes of love. And we're going to take just a few moments and verbalize in your heart to the Lord what that thing is that's concerning you. And now if you're ready to let go of it, open up your hands and let him take it from you. And if you'll notice, your hands are now open and that means you're ready to receive something back from him. So many times we get up after this point. We think we've just given it and we're done, but he wants to speak to us. So with your hands open, Lord Jesus, would you speak to us your bride and would you speak to us what your what your thoughts are toward what we just released to you would you tell us what your heart is for us personally as we listen to you Thank you for the sweetness of your voice. Thank you that we as your sheep know your voice and you desire for us to know you. May we not take lightly what you've spoken to us. We say to you this morning that we love you and our hearts are open to you. In Jesus' name, amen. That discipline isn't new. It's really a form of listening prayer uh, that the ancient church uh, knew and lived in its vibrancy. And certainly there are many of us moderns and postmoderns who are enjoying this kind of engagement with the Lord. And so let me encourage you uh, that uh, give this a try and, and introduce this into the rhythm of your daily engagement with the Lord. Uh, to create space and invitation uh, for the Spirit of God to inform your thinking, certainly on issues that you might be carrying, but even on the grander sense of, God, what do you want me to know about me? And, and what do you want me to know about you? And, and what do you want me to know about 
today or this situation or, or, or whatever you want to construct that uh, invitation for him to speak to you, but that you do it. And, and that you live in an expectancy that God speaks and that he wants to commune and communicate with you personally. I have found in my own life that if I marry that with my encounter with the Word in a frequency and in a rhythm daily, that God has opened His heart to me in ways that I have missed in the past because so often our prayer becomes the to-do list for God and there's little margin or room for Him to be able to speak back into my life. Yes, from the Word. But that rema word, that, that fresh word, the word from the Spirit that He wants very personally for me to know. And so we modeled something for you this morning, hoping that for some it would sit as germ in your heart and that uh, the Spirit of God would take that and awaken within us all a refreshed sense of expectation and invitation to hear His voice. And then to live out of what He is calling us to become and what He is calling us to do. I'm so appreciative for the opportunity to stand before you this morning. I've been living the last several months kind of behind the scenes and had asked us several weeks ago if we could interrupt uh, a very profitable study in the book of Luke for just a couple of weeks where we could hit the pause button and allow John and I to, re, uh, to frame for us uh, some remembrances. I, I think it's good in all of our rhythms, whether it's an individual rhythm or whether it's a corporate rhythm, that we hit the pause button every once in a while and reflect and remember uh, where we have been, where we are, and certainly it sets expectation for what God is calling us to by way of future. And we sit in an interesting time here at Mac, and, and so th this isn't to uh, reshape how uh, the teaching uh, happens on Sunday morning, or we're breaking away from Luke, or somehow the district has an ill view towards expository preaching. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, in, in, um, in all of my ministry, I have found this to be the means of communicating God's Word in a consistent way. To God's people, and so uh, we put a hearty blessing and amen on uh, the vision and on the way that you folks have engaged the Word over these many years. And so really all this is is small interruption, and uh, Brother Ray will be up here next week to uh, bring Luke 15 to us. But, but I thought it would be important, and I sense from the Lord invitation, that it would be good for John and for me to recast and reframe some things that in some sense are basic, um, but are necessary in this season as we wait upon God and, and as we seek Him uh, for what future looks like. Last week, uh, John uh, spent his time walking you through the whole book of Acts. And uh, I'm not going to do that for you this morning. That's, I guess, why he's the DS, and so he can cover a book. Uh, I'm going to look at four verses uh, this morning. Uh, but one of the uh, key takeaways that he left you with last week uh, was this interesting juxtaposition of words. And he said this, The church doesn't have a mission, but rather the mission has a church. The church doesn't have a mission, but rather the mission doesn't have a church. And he didn't coin that phrase. It's been around for a bit, but it's provoking nonetheless. And I sensed from talking with some of you and even hearing the, uh, the, the preset before we uh, entered the word this morning that that has sat deeply in many of your hearts and it is resonating with you. So John unpacked for us again, by way of remembrance, what the mission is. And it certainly gets tied to all kinds of movements and rhythms and expressions as the church moves from season to season, but the, the core of the mission of God is about seeing lost people found. This morning I want to look at the other side of the coin and I, and I want to talk to us a little bit about the church. 
And I think in order for us to understand the, the biblical purpose and nature of the church, we, we have to be reminded of two foundational biblical ideas that really frame and, and help us to understand what church is. And the first is uh, simply the gospel. Now, in the West, we live in extraordinary times. And uh, our idea and understanding and even articulation of the gospel is under a tremendous attack. Consumerism and relevance and tolerance have done a tremendous work, and, and, and hear me in this, I'm, I want to be sensitive, but it has polluted the biblical articulation of the gospel. What do you mean by that, Bob? I, I mean this. For many, the gospel has been framed to them as an invitation to get out of hell and go to heaven. Do you want to escape hell and go to heaven where the streets are full of gold and there won't be any more tears and there'll be some clouds and maybe some angels will be playing harps and you'll get to do whatever you want to do there and it'll all be great. And for many, they have been invited into this gospel, this good news, framed as a place irrespective of a person. And so if God's in heaven, great. If he's not, it doesn't matter because the streets are full of gold and I'm going to get to do whatever I want and there won't be any more crying. And the big thing is I get to escape hell. And we even frame that from a very small age. And there is truth in it, but if it is truth that is not tied to the full counsel of God, it becomes polluted. And so even as we understand uh, from a small age, we ask kids, who wants to go to heaven? Well, what kid in their right mind wouldn't want to raise their hand? Who wants to get out of hell and who wants to go to heaven? Well, sign me up, I'm there. And we set into motion an incomplete gospel that frames invitation to a place not to a person. And of course we use John 3.16 and it is powerful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish, will not experience eternal separation, but have eternal life. And that's beautiful. And it's true. But friends, the gospel does not begin in John 3.16. The gospel begins in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And I want to remind you of that. If we're going to understand the purpose and nature of the church, we have to uh, be realigned to a biblical understanding of the gospel and what we are inviting people into by way of good news. In the beginning, God spoke everything into existence. The trees that you see, the grass, the rocks, all of those things God spoke into existence. The monkeys, the giraffes, the squirrels, all of those things, God spoke and they were there. But he did not do that with man. It says in the account in Genesis chapter 2 that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into man a breath of life and man became a living being. That man was not spoken into existence like the rocks or the trees, or like a squirrel or a monkey, but rather God formed him with his hands and then breathed his own breath into man's nostrils, and man became a living being. And that all sits under the framework that God said, let us make man in our own image. That man was made far differently and his intention, God's intention, was far different with mankind than with all the rest of creation. 
that man was made with a personality that he might relate to God. He, he was made with intellection, with an intellect that he might understand. And man was made with a free will that he might choose either to love or to hate God. And God said this was very good. That man was set apart, even in the way that he was crafted. He was breathed into by the breath of God. And inherent to man are certain characteristics and, and, and intricacies that the rest of creation does not know or possess. That now poises man to live in deep, rich intimacy with God. That man was created to know God and to relate with God and to be known by God and that that was going to be special. Mankind was made for relationship. Interesting then that the text goes on to describe that, that as God was speaking and creating that he pulled... Adam to his side and said, Adam, what do you want to call it? And so here comes this animal, and Adam says, I want to call that a giraffe. God says, it's a giraffe, and it is to today. And he did that with all of creation. And then he, he set man in a garden, and he gave him responsibility to cultivate it, and to subdue it, and to enhance it. Why? Why? Mankind, made in God's image, made for relationship with God, was now endowed with responsibility to represent God in the world. That mankind now was to steward that which God had created. To the point where man was given the responsibility to name those things. And when you name it, you now take authority over it. And so man was given authority now over creation as a steward to represent God in the world. Friends, you must understand that the gospel hinges on those two very important concepts. You and I were made for relationship with the Creator. And we were made intentionally in God's image that we might represent Him in the world. And Adam lived in the beauty of that, un, um, unstained by sin and brokenness. And God said it was very good. And of course, you know the story. With the exercise of man's free will and the rebellion that uh, came with that, sin entered the world. And that relationship with God was broken and man's ability to represent God in the world was corrupted. But God not willing that any should perish brings us to John 3.16. Why? So that we can get out of hell and go to heaven? Certainly part of it. But the core of it is this, friends. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus now brings us back into relationship with God and now the ability to represent Him more fully in the world. The second Adam completed what the first Adam could not do and restores in some sense, some real sense, the creative intention of God from the beginning. I want man to know me. I want to know him. I want him to represent me in the world. And so relationship and representation are now restored, and that is good news. It's good news. We can know God. We can now represent him in the world. The second foundation that I want to remind you of as we think about the purpose and nature of the church, the first being a gospel that is complete. 
a gospel that's not stained by consumerism or by tolerance or relevance or whatever the, the wind of humanity may blow our direction in any given time, that the bedrock of the gospel is about relationship and representation. And that Jesus paid it all that we might walk in that. But number two comes out of the Great Commission. And John talked about the power of last words last week. And of course, I think he even mentioned this. But, but let me uh, have us angle a, a different perspective. Jesus says go, or as you're going, as you're living life, in the marketplace, in, in the classroom, in your neighborhood, wherever you are living out life, you are to live in a new intention. An intention to make followers or disciples of me. And he talks about the initiation of water baptism and how that sets sign to a deeper work of transformation that occurs in people's hearts when they are now dead and they are buried with Jesus and now they are resurrected to a new life that allows them relationship, allows them representation. But then he says something curious, and we miss this so often. He says, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you every second of every moment until the very end. That the crux of the Great Commission certainly is the activity of going and making. But it is about teaching people to obey everything Jesus said, and I think we can infer everything that Jesus did by way of model. That he becomes the standard measure of our activity. Not only in the becoming aspects of our character, but also in the activity of our competencies and our calls. And so oftentimes we have watered down that sense of high bar related to obedience and to discipleship because we are so interested in populating our, uh, our places of gathering with lots of people because, let's face it, more people means we're more successful. More people, more money, more happy people means we're successful. Jesus said, my life and my words are going to be a stumbling block. And so in order to understand church, I'm not talking about this building, I'm talking about the people of Jesus, we're going to have to reset our understanding of the gospel, and we are going to have to reset our understanding of the Great Commission. And all around the world where we see the church living in purity and power, they have restored the high bar of gospel and of great commission in their midst. And so I want to challenge us this morning that we take serious consideration to how we understand and frame the gospel and how we understand and frame the great commission because it sets into motion like a wave on the ocean the purpose and the nature of why God intended the church to be. And so I want to spend a couple of minutes with us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. These are the four verses. That was just preamble. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. So if you have it, find it. If not, you're certainly welcome to listen along. Paul says this in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you 
on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I want to look at four, I want to make four or five comments on this passage for us this morning. The, the first is this. The preamble to walk in relationship with God and to be renewed in our sense of representing Him comes by way of transformation, not merely transaction. Now, there is a transaction that occurs. My sin, my rebellion, my earned death is given to Christ. He takes it and He gives me His righteousness. He gives me His life. He gives me His future. And there is a transaction that is made. But it is more than just a transaction. It demands a transformation. Paul says... You are a new creation, a new creature in Christ. His life now living in and through you transforms you. And the old way of life, my old allegiances, my old appetites, are now dead. And I have been awakened now to a new set of allegiances to a new set of appetites, and to a whole new operating system. Friends, salvation isn't God just cleaning us up and making us better. Salvation is God killing us that we might be reborn now into the life of Jesus in such a way that we live out of His life, no longer mine. So, the old is now gone and it is gone for good, and there is awakened now a new life, a life of the Spirit, a life of transformation. We cannot talk about the purpose and nature of the church unless we understand that the church is populated with transformed people. And so oftentimes, we draw the line at a transaction, Here's my sin, here's hell, you take it, I'll take your life, I'll go to heaven, and then I'll see you when I get there. I have no other need for you. And I'll work it out. And when I get to heaven, if you're there, great. If not, doesn't matter, I just wanted heaven. Where the gospel calls us now into a deep relationship, a restored relationship with God, and that relationship then is a transforming work in our lives by the Spirit of Christ Himself who now indwells us, who now transforms us. The challenge in this day is is that many of our gatherings are populated with people who have experienced a form of transaction, but it is devoid of of transformation and therefore power. And the old appetites and the old operating system and the old allegiances have not been nailed to the cross. They've been set aside so that I can get to heaven, but they are quickly awakened and they live out great power when they were meant to be dead. And much of that is because we have preached an incomplete gospel because we're more concerned with how many people we can register on our list versus the harder work of calling people to come and die that they might live a transformed life. And the stumbling block that Jesus is in the midst of that. So Paul says, we can't even talk about purpose and nature of church until we understand that the nature of those who populate the church are ones who have lived a transformed life. They have experienced new birth. The old is gone. Something new has come. And and Paul says that this isn't something that they've contrived on their own effort. Well, if I just work harder, if I try to be better something good will happen. He says, no, this transforming work is a work of God in their lives. 
It's God's work. And they have created the permission and the margin to allow him to do that deep work of transformation. Does it happen in a moment? It begins in a moment. And it continues to grow. That work of death to oneself and life to the spirit. We call that a big word, sanctification. To be set apart. To be growing in greater rhythms of transformation as we surrender more of ourselves to Him. Transaction is certainly gateway, but it is not finish line. And many of us have been painted a picture that salvation is a finish line. Ah, oh, you crossed the line! You're into heaven! Kick back! It's all good from here. When the Scripture describes salvation as the starting line, of a new life, of a transformed life that now gives expression into, into future. A future where there's less of Bob and there's more of Jesus and I can cooperate now with him in knowing him and being known by him and representing him in the world as Adam was intended to be and to do. The second Adam now gives me permission, and power to live that way. Transformation, not merely transaction. Uh, the second thing that I see in this passage is this. God has one mission. I'm, I'm certain John touched on that last week, but I, I think it bears uh, repeating. God has one mission. And that is the reconciliation of people to himself. Interesting that Paul uses the word to reconcile because it's a highly relational word. It means two parties were at odds and now they have been brought back into a healthy and proper relationship. That that is, those ideas of relationship and, and the personalness of that is exactly the intent of Paul's uh, meaning here. That the mission of the church is not programmatic, though program has a role. Rather, the mission of the church is highly personal. It's about life on life. It's about calling people back to representation and relationship. God has one mission. Reconciling people to himself. Not two, three, four other obsessions. One. One. And, and that begins to shape very clearly what then is the church's response to that. If God has one mission, and that is reconciling lost people back relationally to him, and calling them now to a transformed representation of him in the world, the church becomes the instrument of that mission. And we get caught up in lots of activity, but the heart of God continues to beat that people are reconciled to him. And the interesting thing is, is that God had all of eternity to decide the asset he would use to accomplish this work, this mission. And interestingly enough, he chose but one instrument. One mission and one instrument to complete, one tool, if you will, to complete that mission. And that is his people. It's you. It's me. That whatever God is going to do in the world to accomplish his mission he is going to do it through the primary resource of his people. Living in deep intimacy with him and mobilized now to the myopia, if you will, the, the nearsightedness of that mission. Whatever God's going to do in the world, he's going to do through all of his people. Now, we've made this role of standing up in front of people the rock star role of... Uh, modern Western Christianity. If, if somehow something really magical happens when somebody stands up in front of a group of people and yells at them for 45 minutes. 
what you're experiencing right now. And we've left it to uh, a few select anointed people to carry out all of the mission of God, and the rest of you are just to kind of toe the line, give lots of money, and basically stay out of the way. I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. Now, it's an effective way of managing people. Most dictatorships are. But God's intent is that all of Jesus' people be engaged in the one mission of God's heart. Because you go where I can never go. You live relationally with people that the rest of us may never know. It's you in your neighborhood. God sovereignly put you in that family you're attached to. Your workplace, your area of responsibility was given and crafted by God for you to live out His mission, which is to call people, be reconciled back to God. That Jesus paid it all, that you might know Him, and that you might represent Him in the world. But that takes a group of people who are living in spiritual vibrancy, and it is out of the becoming of that vibrancy that they are then mobilized to the activity. And many of us have been caught in this uh, snare, probably from the evil one in its origin, but it certainly has lots of manifestations and it has uh, lots of window dressing. But it basically says is, you're only effective and identified by what you do, not by who you are. And so for many of us, we are identified by what we do, and our spiritual vitality is measured by the product that we produce, not by the deeper work of becoming that God is doing in us. You see, you cannot represent Him if you are not living in intimacy with Him. And we have changed that around and say, and say it this way, I know I'm in relationship with Him because look at all the work I'm doing for Him as if God needs you to do work for Him. No, He is calling us to join Him in His mission, but again, it goes back to a relational foundation. So as I grow in my intimacy with Him, as I learn to listen for His voice, as I devour His Word and allow His Word to devour me, I am now poised and ready to be mobilized into God's mission. And now I'm convinced of that mission because I know Him. And when I know His heart, then I know the activity that must have come with it. Many of us short-circuit that. We're too busy to engage God this way because we're so busy working for Him. Friends, that is a lie. And that is an incredible error that has affected the Western church in such a way that we are more busy now than any church in the history of the world and completely, hear me, ineffective to the outcomes of God's heart. How can that be? We have more money than any church in the history of the world. We have more asset than any church in the history of the world, and we cannot even reach our own children. So it must be more than about asset... And, ingen and, and, uh, and ingenuity. A form of godliness, but devoid of power. A power that comes through my daily engagement with God and His engagement with me. We must judge ourselves rightly in this, brothers and sisters. And some of us need to jump off the hamster wheel of performance equals identity and re-engage our identity in our relationship with Him and allow that to inform our activity.
Becoming defines our doing. Our doing only makes us exhausted without the identification. God's one instrument. His people mobilized to the work of His heart. A people who are healthy, living in spiritual vibrancy with Him, and now walking out the purposes of His heart through their lives, intersecting with lost lives all around them. In the classroom, in the neighborhood, at the family picnic, here, there, everywhere. When you know the heart of God because you are living in it, you now begin to see the reality as it is. Your employment isn't just about your paycheck. It is because God is not willing that any should perish, and He has placed His church through you in that place. And that takes more priority than how cool our worship experience is, how golden-tongued our speaker is, or the other activities that we do when we gather, because the great power of Muncie Alliance is not in her ability to gather. It's in her ability to be mobilized into the lostness of Muncie. To be mobilized to the lostness of the nations. Because you go places that only you go. You touch people that only you can touch. And we live in a Western culture that is less inclined to have people walk through the doors and say, what must I do to be saved? Go and make disciples. And in that going, we learn to live in intimacy with him. Lastly, we got one message. One message. One mission, one tool, one message. Be reconciled to God. It's a relational message. It's a relational call. It's an invitation to broker a, uh, a, a romance, if you will, between the Creator God and the people He has created. We broker a romance. We matchmake. We matchmake. Not out of a deep theological treatise, and I'm not saying we need to be shallow theologically, but rather out of a vibrant experience relationally that we have encountered with the Creator God. And we are now living out as we represent Him in the world. And so success and how we define it is less about how the world wants to squeeze us into a mold that says Muncie Alliance will be successful when this place is uh, full and we've got three services and there's more money than we can spend and everybody's really happy. Now that, that works beautifully in the business world. Yes? More market share, more profitability, more repeat customers. But I didn't think we were a business. I thought we were a body. And, and therefore, the way that we define success to the outcomes of God's heart must be very different. And I'm not disparaging large gatherings, though I have some questions as to what's going on there. But that's for another time. So let me give you four or five identifiers. I can't unpack them for us uh, this morning. I want to be sensitive of our time. And perhaps there'll be other times where we can begin to journey uh, these ideas a little bit more fully. But let me, let me give you four or five things that, uh, that I think are important for us as we spend some time in this pause remembering what are really the core things that we need to be about and that we need to be restored to. We'll know that Muncie Alliance is successful when the majority of her people are growing in their intimacy with God. What do I mean by that? Let me give you a couple ideas. Well, no, we're successful when the majority of Muncie Alliance people are growing in their intimacy with God because they're feeding themselves daily, they're hearing from God, and they're being obedient to what He is calling them to be coming to do.
I think those are good modifiers of understanding what, what I mean by vibrancy. When the majority of us are feeding ourselves daily, are hearing God's voice more acutely, and are being more ruthless to obey Him when He calls us to action. Whether that is an action of death to myself, or whether that is moving in greater representation of Him in the world. We'll know we're successful when the majority of uh, Muncie Alliance is growing in the fruit of the Spirit being displayed in their lives. Now, if I go live in a cave, I tell you, I can hit it out of the park on those eight or nine manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit of my life. And you probably could too. Matter of fact, I, I thrive when I don't have to engage people. But where the fruit of the Spirit gets lived out and how you can measure His uh, engagement and ownership of your life is through the personal relationships we have with one another. And more important than even with one another, what it looks like when we're out in the world. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Are spilling out of a life that is inhabited by the Spirit of Jesus Himself. And we can test that by how we relate to one another when backbiting and gossip and anger and discord begin to ebb. And the fruitiness, the fruitfulness, the bounty of the Spirit begins to percolate out of all of the relationships we have. Muncie Alliance will know she's successful when the majority of her people are displaying the fruit of the Spirit in the relationships in this place and outside of this place. Number three. We'll know we're successful when the majority of our people here are sharing their story of grace with people who desperately need to hear it. I'm not saying just their testimony of conversion. Because, see, that is the beginning point of a story of grace that actually had a preamble that got you to a place of confession and of transformation. But God interdicts your life and my life daily with all kinds of inklings of his grace. The grace for me to lay down a besetting sin. The grace to live in greater freedom to the winds of the spirit. Uh, the grace that gives me voice to speak words of life to people or to respond when I am treated illly in a way that Jesus would have responded. All become testimony of an ongoing work of grace that this world is desperate to have spoken over them because we live in a graceless world. Certainly uh, see that. America and I travel frequently to India. Millions of deities, not one deity of love. Not one. And when the love and the grace of God is not only proclaimed but lived out in the lives of Jesus' followers in that place, it is like a match to gasoline. And I don't think we're too far away from that here in America. Sharing our stories of God's grace. You are painting a tapestry. Ephesians chapter 3 says that God's manifold wisdom is displayed to principalities and powers in heavenly places. A, a wisdom that is uh, personified in the grace that has been given to his people, and his people are now living that out in great power. So that your brushstroke and my brushstroke begin to paint a full picture of God's incredible grace moved out in the world. And without your voice, Without your brush stroke, the picture is incomplete. 
Number four, we'll know we're successful when we know our spiritual gifts and we're living them out in great interdependence with one another. Not just here, but 24-7. Your giftedness isn't just to prop up a program of Muncie Alliance. I, I think oftentimes we have framed spiritual gifts by how busy then you can be within the midst of this body. When your giftedness comes by way of anointing by the Holy Spirit and is there 24-7 in the world. Not just here, but in the world. We'll talk about that another time. And lastly, I, I think we'll be successful when the majority of our people are stewarding their lives for the kingdom. Now you know the Old Testament model. There were tithes and offerings, 10, 20, 30 percent. But in the New Covenant, you're dead. And you have been born anew as a new creation, and therefore, it's 100%. Not just 10%, not 20%, not just about an offering, it's about your life. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. The power that I have over my wallet, the power that I have over my calendar, the power that I have over my family, all of those things are now submitted for Jesus to use at his discretion, either for me to enjoy, or for me to share with others, or for me to give away. To do what? To further the purposes of the kingdom. Are we stewarding all that we have to further the purposes of God's heart? Which is boiled down to one thing, seeing lost people found. I, I think if we begin to rediscover those kinds of values and outcomes, we will begin to move in greater effectiveness as a body, but certainly no more intimately God's heart for us and for the world, certainly for the nations. So let me give you two questions to close with this morning. Here at Muncie Alliance and in your own hearts, let me challenge you with this question. What does God want to do? What's God want to do? No, 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 not what you want to do, or not what you think you ought to do, or not this is how we've always done it, or oh boy, this is what it'll look like down the road, but what does God want to do? And what would it look like in your life if God did what he wanted to do? Those two questions, I think, become provocative as we seek to leverage this moment that Muncie Alliance finds itself in in these days. A return in some sense to the core values of this place. God wants to speak. And we want to be obedient to listen. What does God want to do in your life? What does God want to do at Muncie Alliance? What does God want to do in the world? And what would it look like if God had his way? Pray with me. I ask God uh, that you would be merciful to us in this season. That as we pause and reflect, that you would do the deeper work that only you can do in our hearts. That apart from you, God, we can do nothing. And so we run back to you and ask, God, that you would fall afresh upon each of us by your Holy Spirit. That you would awaken places that have fallen asleep and gone, uh, gone dormant. And God, that you would refine those places where we are awake and we are active, that 
we might know a deeper sense of submission to your lordship in our lives, your lordship over this gathering of Jesus' followers, and the task that you have given us to do. God, please forgive us that we have framed our spiritual vibrancy by the stuff we do. And God, I pray that you would awaken anew within us a hunger and a thirst to know you. To know you. And the beauty and the awesomeness and the terribleness of who you are. And that we might know a deeper sense of submission and of surrender to your working in our lives to your working in this gathering of Jesus' followers. Uh, have your way. Accomplish what concerns us in this hour. Yes. I said a lot of stuff to us this morning. And church, I, I just want to give you a moment to allow the Spirit of God to sort that out for you, even, in, even right now. And the things of Bob and the and the things that are secondary would just fall by the wayside and hit the floor. And, and the things that God wants to commune and communicate to your heart would find deep resonance in a, in a place of agitation that it would do a deep work in. So ask the worship team to build a longer set here on the back end. And under the cover of that uh, music and under the expectation of worship, I implore you to make yourself available to the Spirit of God's work in your heart. It may demand confession and repentance. It may even demand a, an act of your own uh, demonstration of falling on your face at your seat or coming forward or whatever that looks like. It's a renewed call to intimacy with Him. It was born out of love, not duty. It was born out of grace, not fear. And so I just want you to take a moment in the silence before the, the team brings us into that place of worship. Allow, your, allow yourself to be encountered by God and to encounter Him.
heart. Would you search us to know if we're seeking crowns? Are we seeking some other result that is not you? But that we would seek you, God, above all else, that you would be our reward.